it's not fair for people that uh, struggle with the three and five year old to get them ready to come into the building and uh, had difficulty uh, getting here and they finally got here and that's their offering, that's their sacrifice. Yeah. And then for me to lead them where I am ready after an hour or two of prayer and practice with the worship team. I am here, they crawled into the building down here. And you don't start depressed, but you start with hope where people are at. And you have to lead them. Oftentimes people require the congregation, the church family to leap from kindergarten to 12th grade in the first song. And it's not necessary. It's, it's, it's so much easier just to be ready. You can't take people in worship where you haven't gone in private. You can't take them in a corporate setting, in a worship experience, where you've not gone yourself when nobody was watching. And it's not the, 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 the great strength of the music because, uh, you know, if you're playing your guitar in your room by yourself, you're not going to have the full sound. It's not that. It's not the beauty and the wonder of of a great team together. It's just the fact that you by yourself, maybe with no instrument, just took time to minister to the Lord. And it's learning to respond to Him. It's really all about Him. But a worship leader has an unusual assignment because they have to keep one eye on God and one on people. And it's, uh, you say, well, I'm there to worship. Yeah, yeah, you are, but it's not about you. It's not about your experience. Um, you do that before you get up there so that when you're there, you can monitor how well people are following, not to grade them. Scolding people who are not responding will not help them to respond. And the reason is because it makes them self-conscious and the enemy of worship is self-consciousness. If you heighten a person's awareness of their lack of faith or their lack of boldness or lack of courage, all you've done is emphasize them. And whenever we emphasize the problem it's difficult to come into a solution. It's, it's a lot easier to come to a group of people with a solution without identifying the problem. Now, I'm not saying one-on-one, -on -one, if you're dealing with somebody who's fallen into sin or something. No, I, I understand. We, we confront, we lovingly confront, we honor, we try to bring people into strength. But when you're leading in worship, that's not your role. You're our, our role is to build two things, an awareness of two realities in the room every time you come together. I learned this the hard way. The first thing is you, you want there to always be an atmosphere of love, of compassion. And I'll, I'll explain this more in a moment. The second is there has to be faith because anything we do apart from faith is not pleasing to the Lord. So that means when we come together to worship, Worship actually has to be an expression of my faith, of my confidence, my trust in God. It's not my delight in a song. That's legal, but that's as high as many people get. They like that song. They like when that person sings. They like that guitar, etc. And all of that is very natural, and it's not evil in and of itself. We really appreciate, appreciate this gift. We appreciate what happened up here today. My goodness, I could listen to that for hours. But... The point is, is that when we're leading people, we want to bring them to a place of faith. Um, let me put it this way. You don't build faith by telling people they need more faith. It's the, it's the word of God. Hear what God is saying. Don't preach. Let the preacher preach. You're a worship leader. But there are individual statements sometimes a brief testimony, something to build faith. Let me tell you, uh, let me, I'll just explain to you what happened to me. I used to lead, in, in, uh, lead worship a bit. I pastored an hour from here up in Weaverville, and that's where a good part of our, our team actually came from. And um, I remember one Sunday, I don't know, it, it was just one of those Sundays that I, I just thought it was horrible. People said it was a great message, it was great everything, but they were lying to me. I knew they were. They were none of them were being honest to me. It, just, it was like God was going east, I was going west. And it was just one of those days. And I, I went home and I laid on my bed. I said, <laughs> I said, 
I was going east, you were going west. I don't ever want that to happen again. What happened? And I just laid there. I just laid there for a while. I got my Bible out and just began to read. And I had this verse just leap off the page and pierce me, but I didn't fully understand what he meant, but I knew it was him. He said in Matthew, he said, go learn what this means. I desire compassion above sacrifice. Now, you ever have the Lord talk to you and you don't know what he means, but you know what he said was right, <laughs> what is what you need? That's what happened to me in that moment. I, I knew that there was something in that verse. So I laid there on the bed for quite a while praying, reading over that verse, looking, uh, praying over the verse, meditating on it. He said, go learn what this means. It's actually mentioned twice, I believe, in Matthew. Uh, go learn what this means. I desire compassion above sacrifice. Well, that morning, we were very sacrificial. But you know the scripture. The scripture talks about if you have aught against a brother, make it right, then offer your gift. So there are times where we offer gifts that are not acceptable. They may fit the song well. They may fit the mood at the moment. They may fit the atmosphere fine. But actually on his end, it's not an acceptable offering. And what I saw in that passage, actually, let, let me move on. We had a, a, a gathering that afternoon, Sunday afternoon, uh, we didn't have our own facilities at the time. We were renting the town theater. And, and anyway, it was, it was just kind of a, a, a weird situation. We had this, uh, this room that we'd use for a prayer room, downtown office space. And that afternoon, we had a group of people, about 40 or 50 people come for what was going to be rehearsal or practice for a, um, a musical that we were doing. And there's a whole bunch of people in the room and I walked into the room and I stopped and I looked at these people. These people were hugging each other. They were talking, laughing. They were praying. They were doing all these things together. They were, they were this family of, of rightly connected believers. And I, I stood there and I realized in that moment, that's what was missing earlier in the day. People drug into the room. They barely got there on time or whatever, or they... They were, uh, had a fight on the way or they were worried or anxious or whatever it might be. And so you understand what it's like. People will sit all over different places of the room, very, very disconnected. And there are times where people are scattered all over the room and the body actually has holes in it because there's such a deep disconnection. You actually have a hand over here and an arm over there and a leg over here. And that's oftentimes the nature of the gathering. We don't repair those, we don't fix those by rebuking it or drawing attention to the problem. But what you can do is help to provide a solution. So what I determined to do that afternoon, when I saw what was happening in that room, I realized the affection, the compassion, the connection that people were making in that setting was different than the service that morning. And I determined in my heart that from that point on, Whenever there's a gathering, you, you'll see me here if, if uh, um, on any given uh, Sunday or whenever we have a, a meeting, I get here early. Even in conferences when, when you know, we, we've got meetings, we've got stuff going on all over the place, I get in early. I get in here sometimes half hour early, usually at least 15 minutes early, and I walk around the room and hug people and just talk to them. It's... Um, It, it would be a lot easier to sit up with all my friends and talk over one more cup of coffee. But the point I'm trying to make is, do your part to make sure compassion is in the room because he actually values that more than the song you're about to sing. The song you're about to sing has value in that it was in a context. The dance, the shout, the, all the things that we love to lead in that has value when it's in a context. And the context is we are among people that are willing to sacrificially display compassion, love, affection for one another.